Are you asking me what's the most important scientific finding since Einstein? Ooh, this is going to be a bit embarrassing. It's the work of John Ionides and his paper titled Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Yep, afraid so. And I'm at pains to say that most of the research that you use in your everyday life, the stuff that's been around forever, like flying in planes and most medical research, is absolutely rock solid. You can trust it with your life. Very roughly half of the recent scientific literature, the stuff that you'll often see in your news feeds, turns out being wrong or at least seriously flawed. It's called the replication crisis. Don't believe me? Well, fair enough, actually, because I am a scientist and we get it wrong about half the time. Now, John Ionides' work uh, was showing how hopeless the quality assurance systems are in science and it's been making huge waves across the institutions. But are we doing enough to cure, cure this scientific disease? Here is some evidence to demonstrate a huge amount of this new science's role. So Prince, writing in the journal Nature, found that 75% of the literature used for potential drug discovery targets is not reliable. Marcia Engel, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for over two decades, lamented, and I quote, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. The Lancet, the other hugely prestigious medical journal, acknowledged that, and I quote, the case against science is straightforward, much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, and a flagrant conflict of interest together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. The Economist, which blew the whistle on this back in 2013, commented, A rule of thumb among biotechnology venture capitalists is that about half of the published research cannot be replicated. That's, it turns out to be wrong. And even that may be optimistic because a biotech firm called Amgen found that they could only reproduce properly the results of only six of 53 supposedly landmark cancer research papers. Another observation uh, by the uh, psychological fraternity showed that a grow there was growing concern regarding the replicability of findings in psychology, including a mounting number of prominent findings that have failed to replicate via high-powered independent replication studies. In an introduction to a special edition of a journal called Replicability and Psychological Science, editors Pashler and Wagonmakers ask, and I quote, Is there currently a crisis of confidence in the psychological science, reflecting an unprecedented level of doubt amongst practitioners about the reliability of research findings in the field. And they answer the question in the affirmative, warning that research findings that do not replicate or turn out to be wrong are worse than fairy tales. With a fairy tale, the reader is at least aware that the work is fictional. Say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. This is not good. But fortunately, we at least now know about it and we're starting, however tentatively, to at least admit it and to do something about it. Scientists will often talk about peer review, the system used to check if the new science is right. They often call it the gold standard. They've led the public to believe that peer review is when maybe a dozen other scientists check the work maybe for months, uh, they check all, redo all the experiments, check all the calculations, and then decide if the original work was right or wrong. Well, I wish. In reality, there's usually just two reviewers. They usually just read the work for a few hours. They never do the uh, experiments again, and they will very rarely do any of the calculations in any detail. Peer review is a very cursory form of quality assurance. 
So Professor B Peter Doherty, the famous Australian Nobel laureate, uh, said, and I quote, it's not hard to get almost anything published at some level in what is broadly styled as the peer-reviewed scientific literature, especially if it's well-written and gives the appearance of being done properly. Horton, the editor of Medicine's most prestigious journal, The Lancet, said, and I quote, We know that the system of peer review is biased, unjust, unaccountable, incomplete, easily fixed, often insulting, usually ignorant, occasionally foolish, and frequently wrong. A great description for the main systems that scientists use for quality assurance and quality control. Please like and subscribe. I mentioned that the recent science, the stuff that you get on your everyday news feed, tends to be wrong about half the time. Now, can you imagine if engineers were so unreliable? Bridges collapsing, planes crashing, electronics working only half the time. So why are engineers so much better than scientists? Well, it's because if they mess up, somebody can die or the company can lose a whole lot of money. So they've developed quality assurance systems. They've developed standards such as the SAE and the ISO standards. And if they stuff up, they can lose their accreditation, which means they lose their job, or at worst, they can go to jail. Scientists have this peer review, which is a complete joke. Can you imagine Toyota making a car without quality assurance systems to make sure it was all done properly? Well, that's actually the way we do science nowadays, except it's actually not science if there isn't quality checks. I define science as the use of evidence and logic guided by a quality assurance system. So this is a Toyota that might have been made by a scientist. No QA. Let's have a look at some recent infamous quality assurance failures in science. How about a bunch of papers that were literally made up with bogus data, ridiculous bogus data, to check the peer reviewers in psychology? So one of these papers was titled Human Reactions to Rape Culture and Queer Performativity at Urban Dog Parks. It's about dog-on-dog -dog rape in a park. And it got rave reviewers from the peer reviewers and was published in the journal. Or how about the eight major studies showing that climate change made reef fish go a bit crazy and get eaten by predators, shown to be totally wrong? Or what about the claim that COVID vaccines would prevent the transmission of the disease? Whatever the benefits of the vaccines, this turned out to be completely wrong and has not been admitted by most of the authorities. Or how about the Alzheimer's research on beta amyloids? After decades and billions of dollars chasing this completely wrong research, it was found that it was actually a fraud. Total peer review failure. It's pretty well incontrovertible that about half of the recent science is wrong, but perhaps surprisingly, for most of it, it actually doesn't matter too much. And this is because of the three types of science that I categorise. The first is the stuff that is really not very important and is never used for anything. Now, most published research actually falls into this category. An example might be this paper on the behaviour of mangrove propagules in a North Australian rivers. It doesn't actually matter if it's a complete load of rubbish. The second type of science is that used by industry. They will usually check for themselves whether before they rely on it. And if it's wrong, which it often is, it doesn't matter too much because they haven't chased a dog down a rat hole. Now, the third type of science is where the problem lies. And this is the science that's used by governments for making regulations and uh, laws say, climate change science, some medical science, uh, environmental science, educational research. This is often not checked at all. It's just treated as gospel because it's been peer-reviewed, and we know that peer review is a hopeless form of quality assurance. It is the government, it is the science used by governments which needs to be checked far better than it is today. When an engineer makes a mistake they can go to jail or lose their accreditation as an engineer, lose their career. For a scientist, well, there's almost no sanction. There's no system to penalise the dodgy scientists 
even in the most modest way, except if it's just outright fraud. As C.P. Snow, the famous British scientist, said, The only ethical principle which has made science possible is that the truth shall be told all the time. If we do not penalise false statements made in error, we open the way for false statements made by intention. And a false statement of fact made deliberately is the most serious crime a scientist can commit. If we do not punish errors of scientists, is it any surprise that such a huge fraction of the research turns out to be wrong? Science is at a crossroad. It's made incredible advances for mankind over the centuries, but more and more scientists like me with reasonably distinguished careers are getting increasingly concerned that too much dodgy stuff is being produced far too often. Now, it's essential that we can trust the science institutions. They must get it right almost always, and when they do make errors, they must be quick to admit it. There must never be a hint of ideology, self-interest to maintain funding, or appeals to just believe the institutions because they are some godlike entity. So nowadays, with regard to scientists, there are two types of people. See, in this world, there's two kinds of people. Those who believe and trust the science institutions, and those like me, and uh, who don't, and we want to make them more trustworthy again. To those who still trust the institutions, well, maybe you haven't accepted that 50, there's this 50% failure rate of the replication crisis. Or maybe you don't want to know. After all, it's a horrible thought. We're talking about faith in institutions that we've been taught to trust. And if they are not reliable, it's as bad as dis discovering, for example, that the church has covered up the sexual abuse for decades or that some police forces are full of corruption. We don't want these institutions to be uh, untrustworthy. But regarding science, the science institutions, they undoubtedly are untrustworthy. And in the coming episodes, we'll be discussing in more detail and looking at ways in which this can be fixed.